Sometimes life is really quite strange. And in one of those cases is the Blake class cruisers. Now, why are the Blake class quite so strange? Well, there are a couple of reasons for it. There really are. Um, but we'll start off by thinking it through. Basically, the Blake class are strange because they are first class protected cruisers. And the trouble is for the first class protected cruisers is they have to walk a fine line between being an armoured cruiser and being a protected cruiser. There are also sometimes these things called, rather nebulous things called second class armoured cruisers, which also have to walk that line. But really, first class armoured cruisers have to walk it far more because you're honestly not that far away from being an armoured cruiser when you're a first class protected cruiser. This is also potentially why when we start talking about the Blake class, we talk about their predecessor being the Orlando class, which were first class cruisers or, well, de facto armoured, were actually armoured cruisers. They are specialists. They are powerful vessels. And first class protected cruisers are similar to that. They are powerful specialist vessels. They are capable. Which is why this is starting off kind of strange. Because I'm starting off by talking through an armoured cruiser. I'm starting off by talking through the Orlando class. This is what Aurora, Australia, Galatea, Immorta Immortality... Narcissus, Orlando, and Undaunted all sort of look like. You can see multiple six-inch guns mounted at various positions. You can see their 9.2-inch guns mounted at either end. You can see the engine room, the boilers, all below the armoured deck. And they also have an armoured belt have a conning tower. They have a lot of armour going on. And these ships were pretty darn important for the Royal Navy. They also involve a lot of coal being used as part of their armour and their coal stores to have an impact on any fire they receive. These are designed, ships which are designed to be pretty darn survivable. Now, Why is it worthwhile starting off by looking at them before we start talking about first-class protected cruisers? Because you have a problem when you're designing a first-class protected cruiser, and it's not just getting the balance right. And I've discussed this in other videos. The fact that what is perfectly suitable for a role one year might be not so suitable a decade or so down the road. Even half a decade with the pace of technology and movements in the 1880s, 1890s, and ever since the 1860s. And as I've said, the Royal Navy really did go through a very strange internal period in the 1860s. Oh, for already a large chunk of the 19th century. I believe that's one side. They are constantly trying to deal with the realities of what the opponents are they're likely to face. And those keep changing. And those keep evolving as engines come in. And again, one of the things we often forget about pace of technology is when new systems become available and new systems come into service. They often become available because, sort of quite quickly, because they are low hanging fruit. I. When you first bring in steam engines, the improvements seem quite dramatic almost year on year because you are not refining at the final percentile to get the last inch out of it, the last bit out of it. You are going, oh, well, let's go from single expansion to double expansion. And let's go from triplet to triple expansion. 
let's add in the tubes, let's change the shape of the tubes, let's change the shape of the boiler, let's change the pressure. And you can start jumping up the pressure quite quickly. Now, it's not jumping up to the high pressure you have in US and German boilers in World War II, but you can jump up the pressures quite quickly in comparison sort of in comparison to the difference from the British boilers to the German American boilers in World War II. Yes, the German American boilers tend to be higher pressure. But the British boilers aren't exactly low pressure. It's an advantage. It allows them to get more power per ton, etc. But it's not a colossal leap. Whereas some of the leaps going on in engineering terms at this time are colossal. And you've got the development of the armour. You've got the development of the guns. Everything is going on. And this is where the characters in charge of your development start to really have an impact. And for the British in this period, there is a gentleman called William White. And in many ways, he is the British answer to the question that is Louis-Emile Bertin. What do I mean by this? Well... Louis Emile Bertin is, of course, the engineer and the flower of the Junicole. He is the leading light. He is the archetype proponent and chief visionary. And William White is the person on the British side who looks at the Junicole, looks at the construction program they're, they're ordering, looks at the politicians who are going, should we, should we, should we, and goes, no. We shouldn't. And more often than not, ask the question, what are they on? William Henry White was a very prolific warship designer and chief constructor of the Admiralty. He was the director of naval construction. He was also president of the Institution of Civil Engineers between 1903 and 1904, and had been president of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers between 1899 and 1900. He was a very, very well-trained and a very capable person. He had resigned from the Admiralty in 1883 and joined William Armstrong Company as a design William Armstrong's company as a designer and manager of their warship construction. He returned as director of naval construction with the, also the title of assistant controller on the 1st of August 1885. He starts getting involved in the reorganization of dockyards, in technical departments, and development of the naval department of naval construction. And design on the, well, the 1890s Royal Sovereign class battleships. He took his job incredibly seriously. He's often described as potentially suffering a nervous breakdown, certainly a significant event following criticism for the near capsizing of the new well, the newish royal yacht, the Victorian Albert. She was being fitted out in July 1900 and, well, 700 tons of excessive weight above the centre of gravity in the ship had been added in. This was in particular a lot of uh, soundproofing around the royal apartments. It was not good for the metacentric height of the ship. He was exonerated, but the Admiralty still blamed him for not sufficiently impressing upon your subordinates the novelty and importance of the task entrusted to them. This actually was very detrimental because it meant that his last battleship design, the King Edward VII class, he basically became such a micromanager, he was unable to delegate anything. And he got received early retirement and left the Admiralty on the 31st of January 1902. He 
he is definitely not an ardent politician, definitely not someone who's going to do the bellicose fighting that Louis Emile Bertin gets in. But he's a very serious, very dedicated servant. During his years of service, Sir Henry White, Sir William Henry White, that is, 16 years as head of naval construction, had been in charge for the design of 43 battleships, 26 armoured cruisers, 102 protected cruisers, 74 unarmoured warships. For a total of 245 ships and, in 1900, 1900s money, £80 million. Pounds. The motto on the coat of arms he adopted was Build Staunch and True. And I would argue the Blake class cruisers were some of his best ships. I would also say without him we would have been in a far worse state than we were. It's one of those strange things that he is not always, he is remembered more as he was at the end of his life as being this micromanager who wouldn't delegate than the great instructor, the patron, the educator that he was for much of his career. And it pretty much all comes down to the royal yacht and the incident with that. And this is a man who builds battleships, who builds ships which are so important for national service and the national status and national body, and yet... Well, the buck stops with him. I don't think... There are people who critique the Admiralty for actually saying that... Uh, for stating that he did not sufficiently impress upon your subordinates the novelty and importance of the task entrusted to them. Having read some of the writing he's left behind, having read what others have said about him, that actually to me sounds like something he might have said himself. And they might have been quoting his own words from a discussion back to him. Which, in many ways, would be more mentally damaging, because he already knew it. The trouble when you're trying to educate people, and as you're working, and you're trying to be that sort of leader that allows people to develop their own skills, is you have to place some faith in their actual abilities. And it's very difficult to know at what point you stop being over their shoulder, and at what point you start being more of a mentor friend who they can go to when they have trouble, and at a certain point at which you can start just giving them a task and they go off and do it completely without barely consulting you, and you're just keeping an eye. It's a difficult balance. And the more complicated the tasks, the more that balance gets finite and difficult itself. And that's the reality of it, really. He was trying his best, and he did build some absolutely exceptional ships. As said, oh, he was knighted in 1895, so it's worth remembering that. But he joined the Navy as Director of Naval Construction Assistant Controller in 1885. Blake and Blenheim were laid down in 1888 and launched in 1889. The Orlando class had been laid down in 1885, 1886 in the case of Immortality, and then launched. So most of their design had actually been done before he got involved. So he then watches them. But he's 
watching them, he's watching their construction, he's watching their use, and then he's designed, well, asked to build the Blakes. He's dead. That's what he's charged with doing. And their purpose was to combine roles. They're supposed to be able to do trade protection as well as fleet work. And by the way, if you can do trade protection and you can do fleet work, that means you can also do trade interdiction, right? But that's the one you never talk about. Britain always plans to blockade everyone and interdict their trade, but they never talk about it. They design their ships for trade protection. Same capabilities which make you good at trade protection, make you good at trade interdiction. They were to be the first class of first class protected cruisers built for the Royal Navy. And one of the things you can also say with the Orlandos is that the armoured cruisers had evolved dramatically beyond them. The reason I can say this is because if we think about the particular armour scheme that will be used on the Blakes, but also the fact that the Blakes will have two 9.2 inch, uh, well, two 9.2 inch guns, similar to that of the Orlandos, 10 6 inch guns, six mounted in single mounts on the ship's top deck, which you can see, if you look around, along here, are those sort of, those, what I would call, shielded mounts, rather than turrets, and that's what they do have. They're all shielded mounts. And four in mounted in sort of casemates positions on the main deck. Hmm. 16 3 pounder guns were also mounted. Four 14 inch torpedo tubes completed the ship's armors. Two submerged, uh, submerged tubes and two above the waterline. Ooh. Hmm. Well, let's consider things, shall we? Let's consider the quality of what was built. So, Blake versus Orlando. First class protected cruiser. Well, I said the Orlandos were 1885, 1886. Blakes are 1888, 1889. That's when they're sort of, they're laid down and launched. The Blake is heavier at 9,150 tons. The length, well, they're longer. They have a wider beam. They have a much deeper draft. Four boilers, six boilers. They could later be, would be converted to destroy depot ships. Their guns. Both carry two 9.2 inch guns. The Orlando carried 10 6 inch guns. The Blake carries 10 16, uh, 6 inch guns. The Orlando carries 6 6 pounder and 10 3 pounder. The Blake carries 16 3 pounder. Okay. The Orlando carries 6 18 inch torpedo tubes. Four torpedo tubes in the Blake. Belt, 10-inch armors, and conning tower, 12-inch plus protections for the guns, etc. Blake, between 3 and 6 inches on the deck, depending on, again, where exactly you are on the ship. 9.2-inch gun shields had 4.5 inches of armor. The casemates had 6 inches of armor. The conning tower has 12 inches of armor. Basically, the difference between them is one has a deck instead of the other one having a belt, uh, instead of the and the other one has a belt. But one of them can produce twenty thousand indicated horsepower and get to a top speed of twenty-two knots at force draft, whereas the other can't. 
The other has a top speed of 17 knots at natural draft or 18 knots at forced draft and a maximum of 8,500 horsepower. That's when we forced draft. The other thing I like about the Blakes. They do have two triple, uh, four triple expansion steam engines, but they have two different foot ones for each uh, each shaft. One is a cruising one, one is a speed one. Yeah, they can turn on the power. It's kind of like later when you have steam turbine sets. You know, one is your high speed turbine, one is your cruising turbine. These are well-designed ships, but we are dealing with ships which are half a decade apart, and theoretically, this is the armoured cruiser, theoretically, it's an early armoured cruiser, and this is a protected cruiser. This is, by the way, six double-ended cylindrical boilers to the four double-ended cylindrical boilers supplying this one. It's an interesting ship. Blake and Blenheim both have interesting careers. Blake, not particularly, of course, this is Blenheim. Well, she served as the flagship of the North American West Indies Station from 1892 to 1895. And then she went to the Channel Fleet. In 1900, she was employed as a temporary transport ship, arriving in Plymouth in January 1901 with the relief crew of Empress of India and invalids and prisoners from the Mediterranean Station. Same month, she then was sent to Australia with Captain Thomas Philip Walker in order to relieve the crew aboard HMS Royal Arthur, which was the flagship of the Australia station. And she returned to Plymouth with the former crew of the Royal Arthur in June 1901. This is something I've talked about before. You can send out these big ships with the aggregate crews aboard, a colonel of crew who keeps to this ship, but the aggregate crew aboard to a far station, they work their way out, so you have the presence of uh, one of these ships visiting, and going, hello, look how big and powerful we are, look how many ships we got, it's one you haven't seen before, yeah, it's another one of our ships, we've got tons of them around, and drop off crew, and then go back another way, and visit more people on the way back. She's converted to a destroyer depot ship in 1907, and serves through World War One as a depot ship for the 11th Destroyer Flotilla on the ground fleet. She does really well in this. And she is a really good ship. Blenheim, well, she has other things going on with her. She seems to spend quite a lot of her time repatriating bodies around the world. When Prince Henry of Battenberg hmm, dies from malaria aboard HMS Blonde off the coast of Sierra Leone in January 1896, it's Blenheim which repatriates his body from the Canary Islands. In January 1897, she actually rammed and damaged so he does still got a formidable ram, so don't The uh, five masted bark, France E, uh, one of the um, last and longest uh, tall ships afloat at the time. It was anchored off Dungeness Point, showing two mooring lights at the time. Now, at the time, there was an interesting thing if you had these two mooring lights, because the standard practice at the point was just one mooring light at the bow. But that was the regulations. 
but there was a practice, an informal agreement, that on long, unusually long ships, you put a second one on the stern. However, because that wasn't the rule, the watch officer on Blenheim thought the lights were from two distinct ships, anchored well apart, and therefore sent his ship straight down the middle. Ouch. The watch aboard France I, the vessel which was rammed, shouted, sounded their bell, fired flares, blew the foghorn, did everything they could to tell the Blenheim, you are heading straight towards our centre of mass. And Blenheim manages to alter course, sea ships again, don't turn fast, at the real last possible instance. And France I just received a glancing blow instead of, um, well, smashing her straight down the centre. France I managed to carry on her career of carrying supplies from Europe to Chile after extensive dockyard repairs. And, um, well, a British court actually refused to acknowledge Blenheim's responsibility. This was resented in maritime circles, both in France and abroad. And I, I let's put it this way, I can understand their resentment. I can also understand the, the court going, well, the thing is, here are the rules. They were following the rules of the road. They didn't realise you were a long load because that wasn't a standard, so therefore they're not culpable. It's basically a no-fault accident in that you were doing what you were, to an extent, expect. You were, the, the rule was you had to have one. Uh, but people all sort of knew informally that longer ships did one at the stern as well. So you'd gone through with that, but that then confused the people who weren't expecting there to be a really long ship there, because of course they didn't know, there's no AIS or anything else like that going on at that time. So they're going, hmm, okay, we go straight down there, we see a light there, light there. Well, that can't be two ships stern to stern, so that must be one bow and one bow, so we'll go through the middle to make sure we're safe. Middle, of course, is where the ship was. Blenheim didn't just do Prince Henry of Brandenburg. I almost wonder if Blenheim becomes sort of a funeral ship at a certain point, because she also does two Canadian Prime Ministers upon their deaths. One, Sir John Thompson, was actually Prime Minister when it happened. He was the fourth Canadian Prime Minister. Sir Giles Tupper, the sixth Canadian Prime Minister, who didn't do that many days as Prime Minister, but did some and one of the founding fathers of Canada, as we understand today, was also repatriated in, 19, in 1915 when he died. In World War I, Blenheim took part supporting the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force at the Battle of Gallipoli, and mm, mainly as a destroyer depot ship, but, you know, she was there. She was helping out. She wasn't scrapped till 1926. Other advantage of having these ships around as destroyer depot ships, etc. The destroyers can use the docks for a little while and you can put all the stores ashore or another destroyer depot ship can cover the load while a cruiser repatriates a prime minister so it's not this uh, it's not a um, <clears throat> being rude you need a certain status to repatriate a body of a certain level these days you just stick them in the biggest jet you've got going those days it was more complicated and i have managed to resist the urge to make the jokes you can make about the fourth Canadian Prime Minister and his name. Because he was a serious politician who tried his best for the people of Canada. Not always successfully, it's the same with Charles Topper. But they honestly did seem to be trying their best for the people of their country. They look good, okay? The thing is, you could change some of the design around on these ships. Just a little bit. 
you could fit in twin six inch turrets fore and aft. Or, I don't know, do a little bit of an extension on the hulls, stick in a couple of twin and six inch turrets fore and aft, and they wouldn't look out of place 20, 30 years later than they go out of service. They do look like good ships. I like their 9.2 inch guns. They are a sensible addition, and they give them a very powerful thwack. The fact that they have Humphreys, Tennant & Co. triple expansion steam engines is also quite fun. That's an interesting company which had been founded in 1852, went defunct in 1907. It was headquartered in Deptford, and they primarily did work on marine steam engines. And they were good. Their engines were used in Curacao, Cleopatra, Conquest... The 1875 HMS Dreadnought, the triple, uh, the HMS Victoria, um, they, the Ironclads, Renown, Sans Perel, Trafalgar, all came from these people. They designed boilers, they designed engines, they were one of the best engine and boiler designers of the age. Unfortunately, they didn't manage to last forever. There weren't enough ships. Even when the world started to change in sort of the 1905, when the naval race really kicks off, there's just not enough ships with triple expansion engines and boilers. And they haven't managed to get into turbines and the boiler units to provide it there. Which is a real shame because I have this feeling if the competition between Humphreys, Tennant, Dykes, Morsley, Sons and Field and John Penn and Sons, which were the three really big boiler companies in their era, had kept going you would have seen high-pressure engines in the Royal Navy at a far earlier point because they were honestly competing against each other. That is always the best scenario for a Navy, for any armed forces, is if you have a competition going and there's an actual competition. There's an actual enough demand to generate enough orders that multiple companies can be involved and it's worthwhile competing. It's not a world we have today at the moment, but it's a world you want. These are good ships. They are. I know I've said that a couple of times, but they're good ships. They are presents. They are. I love this drawing of them. I love this drawing of them. It just shows you you're dealing with a really smart looking ship. No, it's not massive. It's not a battleship, but it shows up. You're going to be going, hmm. That looks effective. And it does thread the line between armoured cruiser and protected cruiser quite well for a first class protected cruiser. Which is useful. I'm looking forward to this field of class. I'm looking forward to all the Russian ships when they start coming out. I think you're going to enjoy them. There's going to be a lot of them. See, you can tell when I've written some of these slides and when I have written other slides because I just copy and paste from my standard what it is at that time and I sometimes forget to update them. So, yes, I wrote this presentation a while back. I just haven't liked the versions I recorded up until this one. Hopefully this one is used. Seeing as I'm recording it the day before I drive off. Hundred years of gun cruisers. The live on the 29th of December is going to be interesting. I do love the fact that I've got a 29th of December live, and then I've got a Sunday the 1st of January live, and it's basically going to be a case of thank the Lord, love a duck. I drink iron brew, not alcohol, because.
I drank alcohol like I do this stuff on that period, there is no way I would be I would be awake to do those. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I'm gonna come up with a question, but I'm gonna change the slides to go for uh, go for the question. So. A lot of the time talking about cruisers, I have talked about image and their presence and their ability to develop an image and so forth, therefore magnify their presence. I would like people to put forward their arguments either for or against adoption of this colour scheme. I know for modern ships. I know my colleague Drakenafel is absolutely pro it. And there is honestly part of me which sits there and looks at the ships which have received World War II era Atlantic camouflage and all that stuff and think, yeah, go with that. And I like the giant dragon on HMS Dragon. I like the ships looking a bit distinctive because honestly of engagement ranges, it's probably not going to matter too much. But, there again, there is also a reason you don't want them to do that, because it makes it more, e well, it makes it easier for enemy intelligence to track them. Although, I'm fairly certain, if you have the Atlantic colours and the Chiefs keep occasionally reapplying paint and changing things a bit and doing this, that and the other, it would also make the job of intelligence massively more difficult to keep track going, hang on, we think... Does that splodge look like the splodge on that ship or that ship? Who's which paint splodge is that? So, I'd like to hear your views about paint jobs for ships. Do we stick with the grey? Or would you like to see it change? And if perhaps there are some... If there's enough comments and discussions down there, I might well see if I can't make it a bilge pumps topic. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and um, take care. And as always, I couldn't do this without you, so thank you for your support. Thank you for your likes, your, thank, uh, your shares. Thank you for everyone who is a member, who does super chat, super thanks, who's a patron. Thank you to everyone. It wouldn't take place without you. Trust me. It really wouldn't. Thank you. Take care and have a nice day.